Hello, I'm the board game guru, Steve Tassie, and I'm here to tell you about one of my favorite purchases from Gen Con 2019, and that is Ravensburger's Jaws. From the design team at Prospero Hall, Jaws was a no-brainer for me the moment I heard about it. First of all, Jaws is my all-time favorite movie. Second of all, this is a one versus many secret movement game, and those are two of my absolute favorite game mechanics. So when I heard about this game, I was over the moon. I was so excited that while I was down in Indianapolis, before the convention had actually started, I tried to get the game from Target, because in the States it is a Target exclusive, and uh, all of the ones that I went to were sold out, but I was able on day one to pick up my own copy, and uh, now I'm here to tell you about it. This was not a boating accident. It wasn't a coral reef. It wasn't a boat propeller. It wasn't Jack the Ripper. This was a shark. Jaws the Board Game is an asymmetric, one versus many, a secret movement game. It's played in two acts. Uh, the first act takes place on the Amity Island side of the board. The second act takes place on the Orca side of the board. Uh, you fill these eight spots with tiles representing parts of the boat, uh, and as they get damaged or destroyed, they get flipped over and removed. Uh, one player plays as the shark, and in the first half of the game, the shark's job is to secretly move around the waters of Amity Island, eating as many swimmers as they can while evading detection. The Q and player's job is to get the swimmers out of the water, and as quickly as possible, shoot two barrels into the shark. Every round in Act 1 is divided into three steps. Step 1 is the event phase where an event card is revealed. This tells us where swimmers need to appear, which uh, of the four beaches they occupy. And it will provide a rule or effect that uh, is relevant for this round. Uh, a player might get an extra action, or certain actions might be free, or extra swimmers show up if certain criteria are met, and so on. Then we have the shark phase, where the shark player, using the shark tracking booklet, I've uh, laminated one of these sheets so I don't run out, uh, they are going to track where they go uh, and what they do, uh, and then once they've done that, on here, uh, they will announce to the humans uh, what has happened, um, whether uh, swimmers have been eaten at beaches, whether any of the motion sensors that may be in the water have been triggered, uh, and whether or not powers have been used. The shark starts Act 1 with four power tokens. Each one can be used one time only. Uh, then we have the human phase, where each of the three shark hunting characters will get to take a turn and perform four different actions. Uh, there are some standard actions that they can each use, uh, move, rescue swimmers, uh, and that sort of thing, but each one also has unique possibilities that only they can do. Hooper has a fish finder that lets him uh, drop it in the water where he is, and that will force the shark to show up if that's the location that the shark is currently in, or if that's not where the shark is, but the shark is nearby, so in one of the adjacent spaces, uh, then the shark will announce that I'm nearby. Uh, Brody has uh, the ability to move barrels around on the island to get them to the dock so that the people in the boats can pick them up and use them against the shark. He can also use binoculars when he's at a beach to look out into the ocean, and again, if the shark is there, the shark must reveal himself. If the shark is not there, well then, nothing happens. The chief also has the ability to close beaches. Uh, if he's at Amity PD or in the mayor's office, if there is an empty beach with nobody on it, he can close that beach. 
the next time an event card says play swimmers at that beach instead we flip the sign over and then the next time after that that swimmers would appear at that beach we remove the sign giving it back to the chief so that uh, chief brody can close another beach in the future quint has the ability to fire barrels he starts the game with two barrels on his boat and uh, if he shoots a barrel into his space or an adjacent space uh, then uh, the shark will um, if the shark is there so for example let's say that brody found the shark at south beach uh, who, then quint here could shoot the barrel and that is placed on the shark's board uh, if they can get two barrels on him, then they've ended Act 1 and move into Act 2. Now, if the shark was not there and they shot a barrel into that space, this barrel now becomes a motion sensor, and any time the shark moves through that water space, it must announce to the human players that that motion sensor has been triggered. Uh, whichever side does better in the first half of the game is going to start off at an advantage in the second half of the game. Uh, if the shark eats lots of swimmers, they get extra power cards and they limit the number of bonus gear cards that the human crew get to use against the shark. Whereas if the shark doesn't eat a lot of swimmers before it gets two barrels stuck in it, then the human crew get extra cards and the shark cards are limited. You're gonna need a bigger boat. In the second half of the game, it is a uh, sort of a kind of a submarine battle in a way. Uh, you've got the shark, which is under the water, uh, who periodically surfaces to attack the boat and the people on it. And uh, the humans on the boat are desperately trying to predict where the shark is going to pop up so that they can target their weapons uh, at the right spot of the boat and uh, kill it before it kills them. Uh, the shark has 18 health and each of the humans have 5 health and uh, the boat's got 8 tiles that need to be flipped and then uh, removed. Uh, it is possible to remove a tile from the boat in a single attack if the shark is very powerful. The better the shark did in Act 1, the more of these shark ability cards it will have, and the fewer gear cards the crew will have. Conversely, the quicker the crew managed to harpoon the shark with the barrels in Act 1, the more gear cards they will have, and the fewer shark ability cards the shark will have. Each of the human hunters starts with two character-specific gear cards and then a random set of gear cards based on how well the shark did are drawn and can be assigned as the humans like to the crew. The crew's job is to figure out where the shark is going to pop up uh, and to try to attack it with the arsenal that they have assembled. Now, there are eight different spots on the boat, but the way the game works, the shark only has three to choose from every round. Those are represented by resurface cards that get drawn from the deck, and corresponding tokens get placed on the proper spots. Now, in this case, two of the cards have the same spot on it, which means that the shark is more likely to show up there. Um, and which one the shark specifically chooses will have relevance because the fin on each card tells you how much damage the shark can evade from every attack made against it that turn. The number of dice shown is how many dice the shark will be rolling in an attack of its own. Uh, and if there is the funny fish hook in the vibration lines, uh, that is called a shake off place. And uh, that allows the shark to try to shake off what are called attached weapons. Weapons like the canister or the flare, which have the fish hook on them, these are attached weapons that will have an ongoing effect uh, on the shark or a one-time big effect 
on the shark uh, should they get attached. So once the three resurface cards have been revealed, the shark player will secretly choose the one that they wish to visit. Uh, they will also determine if they want to use any of their power cards. They may use one per turn, and once a card has been used, it is gone from the game. Once the shark has locked that down, then the humans get to deliberate on where they want to go and where they want to target using their character-specific target tokens. Uh, the humans can move up to two spaces on the boat if they wish, uh, and they may target things based on what type of weapon they're using. If they're using a ranged weapon, such as a pistol or a rifle, they can target any space on the boat they like. If they're using a melee weapon or an attached weapon, they must target the space that they are on or an adjacent space. And just like in the first half of the game, nothing works on the diagonal, so no diagonal targeting allowed with melee weapons. The uh, humans will lock down what they are uh, attempting to do, and they will indicate what weapon they're using by placing it next to their character card. Like so. Once they have locked in their own moves, then the shark reveals where it has chosen to surface. In this case, it has chosen to surface at B. So we take away the A and the C. They are irrelevant, which in this case means Hooper will not be able to target the space. Uh, he will not be able to shoot the shark with his rifle. Brody targeted this space with his pistol, which would be a miss, except that the pistol has the special ability that it allows you to target an adjacent space instead. And Quint has used the flare. So now that the shark has surfaced, we know where it is, and we have seen what uh, weapons have been targeted against the proper spot, the humans get to make their attacks. In this case, Quint's flare is just automatically attached to the shark, and it will take effect every turn until the shark gets rid of it. Uh, and Brody is now going to roll an attack against the shark using his pistol. The weapon says two dice, so Brody rolls two dice. That is four hits. Uh, minus one for the evade value of the card where the shark resurfaced. So that's three damage done to the shark. Now, normally a pistol after being used would have to be discarded, but because Brody has an ammo card, he can discard that one instead. Now the shark gets to attack. The shark will roll a number of dice equal to the uh, dice shown on the resurface card that the shark chose. Uh, if the shark is next to one or more segments of boat, then he can attack the boat. Or if there are swimmers in the water uh, where the shark is or adjacent to the shark is, the shark can attack them for the dice value of the attack. Uh, in this case, there are no swimmers, so the shark will go straight for the boat. The shark has done three hits worth of damage. If we take a look at the space, uh, it shows a damage value of two and a destroy value of four. So this is more than the damage value, but not enough to destroy it. So we take the tile and we flip it over, and this portion of the boat has now been damaged. If it had been destroyed completely, we would remove it from the board. Now, if there are swimmers in the water, let's say that uh, Hooper was on the space that the shark attacked and the shark destroyed it. Before the shark swims away down under the waves, it gets to make a free one die attack against anyone that is uh, on its water space or on an adjacent water space. Uh, Hooper was lucky this time and he took no damage before the shark swam back under the wave. And that's the end of a turn in Act 2. New turn begins with new resurface cards, new selection, and uh, new attacks. It's all psychological. You say Barracuda.
And people say, huh? What? If you say shark, you've got a panic on your hands on the 4th of July. This game, uh, I love it. Um, it's a really good version of the movie uh, as a board game. Um, yeah, it's one of my all-time favorite movies, and it uses some of my all-time favorite mechanics, and it's just a perfect storm of awesome, fun, good times. Uh, uh, now, the art in the game, they didn't go with stills from the movie. They went with all original uh, painted art, and I think that some fans of the film are going to be disappointed by that, but I get why they did it. They uh, wanted to evoke the movie without sort of pigeonholing you uh, and, you know, showing you still photographs from the 70s, you know, and shots of what is admittedly a pretty rubber-looking shark. I mean, I love the movie. Uh, it is flawless in a number of ways, but 1975 technology was not what it is today as far as the looks of the film. So I get why they didn't uh, sort of hamstring themselves with photos as their art. Um, this game is great for fans of the movie, but it's also just a really good game. Uh, so if you like Jaws, get Jaws the game. If you like one versus many games, this is a good one. If you like secret movement games, this is a good one. The game plays in about an hour, so it's not as heavy as other secret movement one versus many games like uh, Letters from Whitechapel or uh, The Fury of Dracula, which is, again, one of my all-time favorites. But this is much lighter rules-wise, uh, much faster playing, shorter play time. Um, so it's great for the more casual gamer, but as a serious hobbyist, you're going to find stuff in this game that you will enjoy. Um, I highly recommend that you pick it up. Porkers, Mr. Hooper, you're talking about porkers.